since December of last year, I've filmed five videos and hated all of them. The footage was just chaotic, like spiritually chaotic and also unbelievably boring. Clearly Lila has had enough of me working on this paper for tonight and so have I. Oh my God, how am I supposed to live my life? Here's the thing, I just finished the first year of my two-year master's program in Eastern European studies and it's been just one of the best experiences. I mean, it's the right program at the right time and I wanted to take advantage of everything. I've been like turbocharged with motivation. And in those scrapped videos, I was trying to work my way through my thoughts about it all in a way that would be completely natural if you're out to lunch with somebody and you're talking windingly about your life and they can ask you questions. But when it was just me parsing my thoughts at the camera, I mean, tedious doesn't begin to describe it. So in this video, I wanna at least mention the classes I took in the second semester and what I'm gonna be studying over the summer and then get into the bulk of this catch up chat, which is about my book buying habits over the years. So feel free to skip ahead with the timestamps if that's the part you care about. Both semesters, I ended up taking six classes, mostly because I wanted to, because these will probably be my last two years of full-time school ever. You know, it's weird to think about, but it's probably true. But also the situation was that because my languages were not at the graduate level, which I'm a graduate student and this is my level, so it's a graduate level to me, but whatever. I was taking high intermediate Czech and beginning Polish and didn't get credit for them. So what that meant was that I had to take a full course load and the two languages. And uh, <laughs> was a serious effort, um, but so good, you know, such good stress, honestly. I mentioned my first semester classes in a previous video, which I'll link if you're interested. But this past semester, I took a class on Ukrainian activism and protests since 1990. It was my first sociology class ever, a course on human rights in Central and Eastern Europe. Lots to talk about there. A really challenging course on post-colonialism and post-communism, basically assessing to what extent the post-communist Eastern European space does and doesn't fit into discourses of post-colonialism. And then I did an introduction course for my thesis, which I won't talk about yet just in case it changes, but for now, it's gonna be focusing on a book prize. <laughs> It's all coming full circle. Next week, I'm starting a six week online Polish course where I'll be studying for something like five hours a day. And then after that, I'm gonna be in the Czech Republic for five weeks studying Czech in Brno, the second largest city. And I haven't been back to the Czech Republic since I lived in a town called Trebic from 2015 to 2016. That's right, the last time I was in the Czech Republic, Obama was president. That's how long it's been. And we've all lived many lives since then. Jesus wept. I'm taking these intensive summer courses, again, mostly because I want to. I mean, I actually want to speak these languages and language learning as an adult is such a task. I'm probably gonna make a separate video just unloading all of my joy and trauma. But hopefully my work this summer will also mean that I can take advanced Czech and advanced Polish in the fall, meaning I'd get credit for both and I won't have to take such an absurd course load again. Yay! I'm also planning on taking introductory Hungarian next year for no credit, bohužel, but when else in my life am I gonna have the opportunity to study Hungarian in a classroom? I mean, I can't help myself. What was interesting was that the first semester didn't feel that separate from my typical reading life because one of my classes was on post-war Czech literature. So I read a bunch of novels, short stories, a few essays, and honestly kind of felt like business as usual for me. And then when it came to the second semester, I really wanted to push myself beyond my comfort zone, you know, beyond the literature classes. And so I ended up reading entirely nonfiction, thousands of pages of very dense nonfiction and not a single full book. I've only read three total books this whole year so far, and one of them was this past week. It's the first time in years I didn't even bother to set a Goodreads <laughs> reading goal giving my eyes a rest from that butt ugly interface. So while I'm here and I've hit the pause button on all my previous <laughs> reading routines and preoccupations, I thought it would be interesting to look back on how my book buying has evolved in my relationship to this type of book consumerism. And I'm also gonna mention the titles I've bought since I started grad school because I think all of them are school related. What can I say? I'm a woman possessed. I want to know all the knowledge. I've said on the channel before, I think that especially from 2017 to 2019, 
in addition to being so inspired to read more than I ever had, the booktube Consumers and Bug bit me hard. And I was buying at a rate that had nothing to do with the rate at which I actually read, which is odd behavior if you take a step back and think about it for a minute. It's so normalized on social media, at least, to be like, I went out today and just, whoops, I bought all the books, money flying me. Meanwhile, I have 74 unread books on my nightstand right now. Actually, the rubble of my nightstand that crumbled under my unread TBR. I mean, isn't compulsive, irrational behavior so cute and so relatable? And everybody's gonna comment like, <laughs> relatable. <laughs> and you know, as long as you can afford it, no one is hurt by this. So live your life, buy your books. <laughs> like it's no business of mine. It never got to the point where I had haul after haul on my channel on it. I don't think I came across as a particularly consumerist booktuber or anything like that. But even though I had maybe a mild case of book buying syndrome, I didn't enjoy it. Looking back, there was something mindless about it. It was all just untethered from reality. So in 2020, I started a project that was all about earning new books by reading my old books, that kind of thing. And it broke the cycle so that I felt like for the first time in years, I could see my rationalizations for what they were in the cold light of day. So I ultimately ended up buying 31 books in 2020, and I've since read all of them. Then in 2021, I was severely depressed, let's be honest. So you could say that I didn't buy as much because I wasn't reading as much, but I could see another version of myself who would have just continued buying at the same rate in a dopamine hit kind of way, and that didn't happen. Instead, I bought 22 books total that year, my lowest ever, and I've since read 20 of them. And the two that are left are In Memory of Memory by Maria Stepanova, translated from Russian by Sasha Dugdale. And I just started this this week. It's good to be reminded that just because a book is on a complicated subject, it doesn't mean that it's hard to read, right? I think I intimidated myself a little bit just thinking about this book. And instead now I've read 100 pages without thinking about it and it's been such a pleasure. Anyway, shall I turn the camera a little bit? Uh, there we are. All right, I'm pretty far out of frame now, but I don't think anyone's complaining. The second book that I have left over from 2021 is Black Earth by Timothy Snyder, his book on the Holocaust. And I'm hoping to read this one next. And that's pretty great to think that the majority of those 2021 books I read within a year and then a few stragglers within two years. Nature is healing. No, don't hide your gorgeous face. He's gonna turn his back to us and I'm gonna re-enter the frame. Now, 2022 was a tale of two halves. In the first eight months of that year, I bought 13 books and I've since read 11 of them. I was really on a roll of starting a book the day that I bought it. What a feeling, one of life's simple pleasures. One of those is this Ukrainian novel on collectivization called Sweet the Russia, A Tale of Two Villages by Maria Matios. And this is translated from Ukrainian by Michael M. Naden and Ol Hati Tarenko. And then the second remaining TBR book is Sovietistan by Erika Fotland, translated from Norwegian by Carrie Dixon. I had read more than half of this over my fall break last year, like honestly close to 300 pages. Um, but at this point, it's been months and I'd rather go back to the beginning than plow ahead, you know? Then from September to December of 2022, I bought 11 more books, all from school and school-related events. So let's start with the novels, the first of which is Time Shelter. This is by Georgi Gospodinov, translated from Bulgarian by Angela Rodel. And Gospodinov was one of my professors in the fall and I got this at a book event with him and he's really just a lovely man. I read more than half of this over my spring break this year and was loving it. I was honestly surprised by how taken with it I was. Um, but like with Sovietistan, I'm gonna go back to the beginning with this. My goal is not to have read books. My goal is to read books ideally in a, you know, centered, collected headspace, right? The only one of this category that I've read so far is a novel that I chose as part of a project for my sociology class, and that's how I <laughs> managed to squeeze it in. It's called Mondegreen by Volodymyr Rafayenko, and it's translated from Ukrainian by Mark Andrichik. Andrichik is a professor at Columbia, and again, I got this at a book event where Rafayenko came to talk about how he's from the eastern part of Ukraine. I believe he's from the Donbass. Um, and when the war started there in 2014, he fled to Kyiv and changed his native language from Russian to Ukrainian. He'd been a renowned novelist writing in Russian for years. A number of novels in Russian that had been nominated for Russian language prizes. And this is his first book to be originally written in Ukrainian. The narrator of this book is a man who is fleeing war in the eastern part of the country. 
has gone to Kiev and feels completely disassociated and dislocated both geographically and temporally and linguistically because the narrator is changing his native language from Russian to Ukrainian. And there's such a sense of confusion and loss, but also gain in here. A sense of the narrator's roots continuing to follow him in the form of these grotesque fairy tale-like figures. The way I described it to my class is that Rafaenko's writing makes Joyce's look conventional. It's really a trippy book, and I think particularly for people who have lived in a language that's not their first language and that they're not totally comfortable with yet, that there will be something that you really relate to in here. Then there are four Czech novels I bought because they weren't on our syllabus, but they're critical 20th century writing that I want to have in my mind palace, you know? So one of those is Karol Čapek's War with the Newts. These are all translated from Czech. This one by M and R Weatherall. Josef Škvoretsky's The Cowards, another big one, and this is translated by Jean Niemcová. Then The Big Daddy, a real Czechs, Czech writer, none of that Francophile stuff going on. Hrabel, Bohemian Hrabel's I Served the King of England. This one is translated by Paul Wilson. The last of these and the most interesting to me is called City of Torment by Daniela Hotrova, which is actually three novellas and they're translated by Vyachlinik Fierkusny and Elena Sokol. I've actually read the first of these novellas. It's called In Both Kinds and it blew me away. Then I also bought two poetry collections, one from Czech called Dream of a Journey by Katarzyna Ruchenkova. This is translated by Alexander Buchler. I mean, look at this cover in Depresses Man. This image is by Daniel Kikin, and the cover design is by Emily Cordell, so props to them. And the other collection is by a Polish poet named Jerzy Fitzowski, and it's called Everything I Don't Know, translated by Jennifer Groats and Piotr Sommer. And I got this at an event with the translators where there was a bit of um, Rashomon happening in the telling of how they translated. Piotr would say something like, oh, Jennifer really had the last word on everything. And you could see that Jennifer's face was saying, no, I did not. <laughs> Are we even remembering the same conversation? Finally, from last year were three nonfiction books, three bangers, well, I mean, fingers crossed. The first is called The War Within Diaries from the Siege of Leningrad by Alexis Perry. We wrote a portion of this for our class on legacies of empire in the Soviet Union, which I had in the fall. And it was, really excellent scholarship and she was interrogating a lot of the things that we assume that we can learn from reading people's diaries and the type of people who are represented by diary writing. She came to speak to our class and there was a lot that she said that was off the record but I think it's no surprise to say generally that the reception to this in Russia before the full-scale invasion obviously the reception was um, none too Kind. There's a lot of lionization around the people who suffered in the Siege of Leningrad and the portrayal of them as unambiguous heroes. And there's a lot of truth to that, of course, but some of the things that she found in the diaries were unsurprisingly unheroic because these people were humans, right? And that was not well received. Then one of the books I'm most excited about from this whole <laughs> list is called Yellow Star, Red Star, Holocaust Remembrance After Communism by Yelena Subotich. I'm also sorry to any Eastern Europeans whose names I pronounce as though they're Czech. <laughs> That's a hazard of your name existing in my brain. Subotich also spoke to our class and she was talking about how the perceptions of like what we culturally understand to be the Holocaust were things that, that really began from the 1960s onward. And a, a particular cultural crystallization happened coming from three countries, Germany, Israel, and the United States. And these countries' conceptions of what the Holocaust was and the idea of it being the central event of the 20th century, that that ended up permeating other cultural consciousnesses. Meanwhile, these types of conversations were not happening in communist East Central Europe. The Holocaust was barely mentioned in those countries during that time. And then after communism, there was such a huge push to do the return to Europe. That was the rhetoric at the time. And one of the ways that they found that they could perform Europeanness was that uh, the governments of these countries decided to perform Holocaust remembrance. And not all of it was hollow, but they were trying to mimic a sort of cultural memory that was not native. And a lot of that performativity was bound up with performing anti-communism. So that the idea of the struggles and the sufferings under communism were equated with 
The Suffering of the Jews in the Holocaust. I'm really excited to read this one. And I think once I've read this and Time Shelter, I'd like to review them together to talk about memory politics, which if you study East Central Europe at all, you know that that's one of the major, major points of discussion in scholarship these days. Lastly, I have a biography of a major Polish 20th century figure, Józef Piłsudski. We don't have the diacritical marks here, so I hope I said that correctly. And this is by Josh Zimmerman. Lots to unpack about him, and it's the kind of life that really deserves a chunky biography. All right, and then in 2023, I've only bought three books so far. One was from an event with a Ukrainian poet. It's called Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow by Natalka Bilotserkivets, or Bilotserkivets. Not sure of Ukrainian emphasis there, but this is translated from Ukrainian by Ali Kinsella and Zvinya Orlovsky. I got a lovely inscription on this one as well. I spoke Czech and Polish to this poet because she only spoke Ukrainian, and I think we understood each other pretty well. There's a poem in here that's incredibly famous in Ukraine in the form of a song. It's called We'll Not Die in Paris. I also bought a book for my thesis. Most of them I'm getting out of the library, but I knew this one was just too delicious to pass up that I just want to annotate the ever-living daylights out of it. This is called Transatlantic Central Europe, Contesting Geography and Redefining Culture Beyond the Nation by Jesse Laboff. When I saw that somebody had written this book, I was just relieved that I got to experience it. And then, because I'm predictable, I pre-ordered The Fawn by Mokta Sobu, translated from Hungarian by our man, Len Rix, just published by the New York Review of Books this year at the end of March, and it's a translation of her second novel. Oh, and I just found the bookmark I had been using, which has the name Bakhmut on it, which makes me want to cry, honestly. This postcard says, Unbreakable Bakhmut. Yeah, believe me, the, um, the war in Ukraine is just a constant point of, of discussion in all of my classes and in my program generally. Ugh, sorry, this really, really sets me back to look at this, but I think um, this is an accurate representation of um, how emotional our field is at the moment. So, Slavu Ukraini, and let's all read Mokta Sobu. Putting all the pieces together here, since 2020, I've bought exactly 80 books, and I've read 63 of them, which means I have a TBR of 17. How lovely and normal and manageable. I'd love to hear how you're doing in the comments if you've read anything great recently because I've fallen off the face of the earth in terms of knowing what books are new or what anybody is reading and I'll see you soon for another video.